Hi, and welcome, and thank you for joining us uh, today for this very informal Alzheimer's conversation on Facebook Live. I'm Nancy Lynn from Bright Focus Foundation, and I'm zooming in here from Santa Monica, California, um, but Bright Focus is based in Maryland, and we fund scientific research uh, to understand and treat Alzheimer's disease, macular degeneration, and glaucoma. So first thing is I am not a doctor or a scientist, but for more than a decade, I have um, been working with a lot of research scientists as well as patients and their families um, living with Alzheimer's. And um, part of our, our mandate at Bright Focus is to provide as much information as possible um, to everyone who is a stakeholder in, in the problem of this disease. And since uh, nearly 6 million Americans have Alzheimer's today, um, and now they're dealing with COVID uh, on top of the Alzheimer's, um, care partners definitely need to know they're not alone and that they can get information, up-to-date information. So I'm here with uh, Sharon from, uh, uh, Sharon, with Anna from Indiana, sorry, her mom is Sharon. Um, Anna from Indiana. Anna helped her mother, Sharon, care for her dad, Pat, for, uh, for about 14 years over the course of his living with Alzheimer's. So she has a lot of firsthand experience to share. And Anna and her parents were featured in a very moving uh, documentary by director, producer James Keach called Turning Point, The Quest for a Cure. And um, Kate and Sarah who are helping us out today are posting a link in the event discussion uh, uh, sections to, to show you where you can go to view that film because it has a lot of information about Alzheimer's disease and research and clinical trials that uh, you may be very interested in. So Anna and I both participated last summer, which seems like a thousand years ago, um, in uh, an educational webinar series produced by uh, NeuroCare Live. Um, and Kate and Sarah are gonna be posting a link to these webinars also. I think there are two that we were in um, and we encourage everybody who's interested in, in this subject to view those very informative webinars. They're free. Um, they go into a lot more detail than we're gonna have time for today. Um, and we're gonna show a short clip at the end of this session today uh, from those webinars. It hopefully will be helpful, helpful and give you a sense of what they're like. So, over the next 30 minutes or so, we're going to touch on uh, just a few things, the tip of the iceberg with this disease, some of the early signs and symptoms of Alzheimer's, um, how and why to get a memory test um, and try to get a diagnosis, a full diagnosis, why it's very beneficial to get an early memory screening and a diagnosis really as early as possible, um, how to cope with being a care partner um, and why and how you can participate in clinical trials and research studies that um, could ultimately help lead us to treatments and a cure. So uh, please feel free to post questions or comments. And if you wanna reach out to us directly, we're gonna be posting an email address at the end that you can, can write emails to us for. So um, Sarah, if you would screen share our first slide. Um, I, um, Wanted to share these photos, Anna, of uh, your wonderful parents. Oops, we lost them. Or maybe they're being shared. I hope they're being shared. Um, there they are. Um, Anna's parents, Pat and Sharon, uh, I, I have to say, because I got to spend time with them, were two of the funniest, warmest, most intelligent, uh, just lovely people that I've ever met. And um, I just wonder, because you're actually seeing pictures of them from the documentary um, and you see them laughing and engaged. They, they were so warm and, and seemed so casual all the time. How did you first notice there was something going on with your dad? How did your family get like for, first signs and symptoms and what did you, how'd you react? You know, my dad has always, he was always very absent-minded he would forget to pick me up from dance class. He, that was, that was my dad. So as he started to develop what now I look back in hindsight and realize were symptoms, um, 
I think that the first thing that really struck me as not just being absent-minded, he um, was driving home. It, it would have been a normal work day. Um, he showed up at my house in Fishers, Indiana, which from his work was probably about half an hour. And I, I, you know, opened the door, I said, dad, Hey. And, and he, he said, Anna, I, I got lost on the way home from work. I, I didn't know how to get home. And from a, a job that he had been driving to, you know, every day, that was very alarming. Um, that was in 2010. And up to that point, like I said, I think we, we had been noticing some things, some, some odd, um, he, would, he would repeat himself, he would leave the lights on in the car, things like that. But, you know, again, we just blame that on dad's um, absent-mindedness. But that really, really struck me. And as I think about it, you know, I think maybe mom was, was not telling us the whole story that maybe there were some things going on and she was trying to protect us from that but right. I let her know and it was it was very shortly after that that they did they went to his general physician and she did at that time say um that's the first time we as a, a family heard the word Alzheimer's and that 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 could be you definitely need to um, have further testing but I, she suggested that. And I remember that day that my parents went to the doctor, they came over to our house and to hear that, even when we, you know, we kind of knew it was just, it was absolutely devastating. Um, that was in 2010. So we did do some further testing with a neurologist. My dad at this time was a 61 or 62 and the neurologist after the testing said, you know, I don't, I, it could be, I really don't think it is. My dad was diabetic. So um, they let us know that it could just be his blood sugars out of whack or um, he needs to, they, they suggested that he take more vitamin um, B12. Um, so it, it really, and for us as being in denial as it was to hear a, a neurologist say, May, you know, maybe it's not that he's young. Let's just see how, let's take this course of action and see how it goes. That for us was all we needed to, to hear. He, he didn't have it in our, in our minds. And so then, you know, we continue the denial process going forward. Uh, it wasn't until 2014. So four years later, after that, that we got a, a official diagnosis. And that's when we really decided we need to, we need to get a diagnosis and we need to move forward with this. And it, it's interesting to me because when we were talking before, you were mentioning to me 2006. So that's already yes. eight years yeah. before you're talking yeah. about getting an official. What happened in 2006? In 2006, my dad lost his job as an editor at a newspaper and he'd only been in the job a very short time, maybe six months. And my dad was a, a very dedicated employee always. And so that was very odd for us. And he couldn't really so say you think that it had to do with, with absolutely 100%. Yeah. And, and as we, as I look back, knowing he, he, he was definitely showing signs and symptoms as, as early as 2006, we yeah. just, we couldn't accept it at that point. Right. It's it's fascinating that it was really eight years before you were fully there. And absolutely, actually, I'm going to ask um, Sarah and Kate to share um, the next slide before we go more into the diagnosis and memory screening uh, piece. But um, to talk, uh, I just wanted to share with everybody, and I encourage you, you viewing if you want, because we're not going to have time to go through each of these things to just take photographs of the slide on the screen. And we're gonna share it with you after if you wanna get it. But if you wanna just take a picture of the screen, you can. This is a, the Mayo Clinic's list of early signs and symptoms of Alzheimer's disease. And I think, I find it a little technical, cognitive changes, psychological changes. And, um, but it is good to refer to and think about if you're not sure, like Anna's saying that it's, you know, he's always absent-minded or she is or, um, and I added the two in red um, and it's really interesting to me because 
those are the most common things I hear. And those are two of the things you mentioned, right? Is uh, I said trouble like with driving, uh, you know, getting lost, trouble, you know, balancing your checkbook or things that you can normally do really well um, that suddenly anything requiring executive function that goes out of whack. But the thing I always see the most or that people seem to react to the most is when, you know, you just asked me that question, dad, you asked me that five minutes ago, what's for dinner? I just told you that. So I like that, I just wanted to put that up sort of as an extra thing because I think that's one of the most common. Um, yeah, common I would completely agree with people, that. And people get mad. Uh, I think we talked about this in the webinars. People sometimes get mad at their parent when they ask a question or their spouse uh, over and over. And they say, um, actually a friend of mine who's watching this used to say, they just want to, or their, her, her brother used to say, they just want to get attention. You know, they're just asking <laughs> me over and over again because they want to get attention. They know I answered. That's not true. This is a disease. There's actually, you know, synapses that are, are stopping to fire. So now I just want to ask, so how did you, approach getting your dad the first memory test how did he react did he resist you know how did the family react yes so i i actually went to the first test with him it was um my mom was working so it was just he and i and i could tell that he was really embarrassed he he knew i you know i'm his daughter he didn't want he didn't want to alarm me in any way so he just with all the tests, he kept telling me, it's okay, I'm fine, I'm just absent-minded, I'm, I'm healthy. And, you know, at that point, I think he could tell there's something like not, not quite right with me, but, but I, I can't let other people know that. So it was, it was a very- Stigma, shame. Yeah, very much so. Um, so, we did, and that was the one where they thought, I, I'm, not, I'm really not sure that, that, that that's what it is. So, and, and um, like I said, that, so as a, a family that was in denial, that was just, that was all we needed to hear. And it was. Yeah, that's interesting because I had uh, in my notes to say that a, a memory screening is different than a diagnosis. Mm -hmm. And um, there can be a first memory test and then there can be more memory tests. And just your doctor can give you a memory test if you're wondering, well, how do I even go? What do I do? Where do I go? Mm -hmm. um, various types of qualified healthcare professionals can do this. Um, even a phar pharmacist sometimes will do it. Doctors, um, social workers, physician assistants, nurses, psychologists. This is just uh, a face-to-face, one-on-one although you went with him, I don't know if you were in the room while he was doing the test, but you can do it in private. And now, of course, a lot of this is being done online. So it's a very private thing. You don't have to, that doesn't have to be shared with a lot of people. And it's usually a series of questions or, um, or tasks that test, test your memory. Can you remember the three words, that kind of thing. Um, also your language skills and your thinking ability. And um, I just wanna mention that for folks who are over 65, um, you, you are entitled uh, to an annual wellness visit uh, from Medicare. And there is a special code and reimbursement that the doctor, the doctor can get paid if they give you a memory screening or a memory test. But most people don't know to ask for it. And a lot of doctors don't even know that this is available to them. Or they might decide, oh, I'm not going to offer it if they ask, I'll give it to it because it takes extra time. And, but you can ask every year at your annual wellness visit to have a memory screening. And it's really great to have, I'm gonna to refer to this a lot of baseline screening, even if you're younger, and I'm gonna talk about that later, um, so that you have something to compare to whoops, over time um, that sh will show you if there are changes because you may be at a different baseline than somebody else. Like you say, your dad was already kind of, right. somebody else might be really. And so it's how much do you change um, over time. And so it's interesting because you already answered really the next question. And I, the clip I know talks about uh, denial. So I wanted to say, ask you if you hesitated to find out what was going on. We hear a lot about denial. People don't want to know about themselves, um, but they don't want other people to know. You mentioned, especially if somebody mm -hmm. is still working, they don't 
want other people to know that they're getting this test. Doctors oftentimes don't want to give a diagnosis and so they can be in denial and they can encourage your denial. I don't know if your people were encouraging you or just trying to not get you to be alarmed until they knew what was going on. But um, so what was it that made you guys persist, right? Because you said after the first one, uh, you were like, oh, they said it might not be this, it's probably not. And then four, it was four years later until you really went all the way there. So what right. brought you to go all the way there? We, it was his, his progression. It, it, it really, really became noticeable. He started to withdraw from, from conversation with anybody because I think he knew that he was repeating himself. And again, with the stigma, he was very embarrassed. He didn't want any of his friends to know. Um, there, there were certain things he would, he, in their home that he had lived in for 10, 15 years, he would forget where the, um, his bedroom was or which door was the bathroom. Um, I actually did, I lived with my parents for about five years um, during all of this. And that was the point where my mom and I together decided we, we have got to, we've got to get this diagnosed. I think in our heads, we absolutely both knew exactly what was going on. Um, his symptoms were just becoming too, too progressive to where he, he wasn't driving anymore, things of that nature. You couldn't nature. deny it anymore, you just couldn't. Exactly, it was, and we needed to let, we needed to have that diagnosis to let other people know. Right. So it was, it was we, we couldn't interact with people because we always had to sort of explain him. Right, and actually it's a perfect lead in because I did wanna take a few more minutes on the importance of getting a screen and early. And so one of the things we really wanted to want people to learn, which I think most people and even a lot of doctors don't know, is that Alzheimer's pathology, the actual physical changes that are starting to take place in your blood and your brain and everything, start 10 to 20 years before even the first symptoms start to begin. Incredible. So it's like with cholesterol. Cholesterol can be building up in your arteries for decades, you know, before you realize you have heart disease or have a heart attack or something like that. So, um, and one of the reasons why it's so important to try to get a baseline screening early and to know this, that it's happening in your body 10 to 20 years before you might even have an inkling is that there are lifestyle modifications that you can make that could help. They may not make you never get Alzheimer's, but they could help delay the onset of the disease significantly. Um, exercise changes, uh, eating changes, sleep, uh, uh, not being isolated, being socially engaged. And there's a lot of research studies, which we're also going to talk about, that are actually, you know, trying to prove these uh, these things out scientifically. They say what's good for your heart is good for your brain. And so brain health is a whole new field. Um, so you can do things um, if you know early. And I wanna ask uh, Sarah and Kate to just throw up slide number three here um, because there um, is on the National Institute of Aging's website, uh, a wonderful page um, that we have here on the next slide um, that lists not only clinical trials and research studies, but registries and um, web studies, especially during the time of COVID, you know, if you don't want to actually go to the doctor and get a memory screen or go talk to them about it. Uh, sorry, not this one, Sarah, we want to go to um, the registries. There we go. Um, so the link on the top there, if you take a picture of it, that will bring you to the information that's below. Um, I've signed up for two or three of these. <laughs> um, as one, as you can see, is open to age 18 and older. One is 50 and older. But you, these um, registries or studies will actually contact you, email you, um, some, maybe it's every quarter or, or twice a year, and give you some kind of a test and questionnaire online. And this is a wonderful way, even if, like I say, even if you're 18, that you can have somebody monitoring if there are any changes over time. And if they see some kind of dramatic change in your cognition, they're gonna contact you because they're gonna want 
to study, you know, see if you're willing to participate yeah. in a clinical study, you're not obligated, but it's a great way to sort of get extra eyes for free on what might be happening in your brain, especially because I think, you know, over, we all believe over the next five to 10 years that there are going to be therapeutics mm -hmm. and better diagnostic tests and things like that. So um, I guess my, my main thing is try to get involved in some of these things as early as, as you possibly can, even if you're perfectly healthy, um, it's really worth learning about what you can do. Um, so just, um, Sarah, if you would just move to the next slide. Um, I just wanna move directly into um, all other reasons uh, why it's really good to know. Cause I hear all the time, well, I, why do I want, I don't wanna know, there's nothing I can do about it anyway. And doctors are guilty of this too. I can't prescribe anything to them. So I can't really take the time to tell them. So here are uh, a list of 12, and I could probably come up with more reasons why it's actually very beneficial. And I just actually wanna talk about the first four or five. Um, I talked about lifestyle interventions. You know, the biggest risk factor for Alzheimer's is age. And obviously we hope we're not gonna modify the fact that we get older, but there's a lot of other things that you can, <laughs> you can modify. Um, and, you know, like they said to you, it might be something else. It, this may not be Alzheimer's. So the, one of the first benefits is you can rule out if it's something else entirely. Mm -hmm. There are other things that cause symptoms, even depression, that can cause dementia-like symptoms that aren't. So you could go on a, a depression medication and, re, and that will, you know, you take away the fear and the stigma. Um, the other thing is that uh, therapeutics will probably be more effective if you're taking them very early on in the progression, then you know when you have full-blown Alzheimer's because your brain has already deteriorated, your synapses have already deteriorated so, to such an extent. Um, skipping to number five, um, spending time with your loved one while they're still relatively cognitively okay is one of the things I hear the most. I you know I want to spend quality time with them while I have them. So you want to know and you want to be able to plan for the future, financial planning, you know, um, life care, medical decision making and those kinds of things. And um, while all of these are, are really great, um, I, I would also just emphasize opportunities to participate in clinical trials and research studies and registries, as I mentioned. So um, you can take the slide down now. And I wanted to ask Anna, um, you know, when, when James was filming the documentary, your Dad and mom were participating in a, a clinical trial, and that's why you were recommended for the, for the movie. And um, a lot of the movie shows them and you, uh, everybody yeah. participating in this process. So, what's a clinical trial in total lay terms? Um, what? How did you learn about it, and how did you know you had the opportunity, and how did you get into it? So, first, I want to say on the prior slide that being going through the experience of, of having a loved one with with Alzheimer's. I couldn't agree with you more that I wish that we would have found out earlier. I, mm. That is just, I really, it's so important, like you said, to be able to spend that quality time with that, that loved one. Um, so with the, with the clinical trial, uh, my, we, my parents were asked if, if they'd like to participate and just from, you know, knowing nothing That's about it. Through a, the doctor? Did the doctor? Yes, through, okay. the, do through the doctor. Um, and no knowing nothing about it, I was told by my mom, it's they will, they'll, my, my, your dad will be either get um, an actual drug or a placebo. We will go through a series of appointments, testing, all kinds of great, great. You're getting the best healthcare possible by going through this. And so, so we thought, why not? I mean, why not participate in this? And it was at a that point, experience for you. Oh, such such a great experience! And at that point, my dad could definitely still he understood what it was, and he he said, "Hell yes, get me in that," because for him, he could take this horrible diagnosis and do something good with it. If it wasn't going to be a cure for him, it could be for us or you know, his grandchildren. So it was his way of, of fighting Alzheimer's. It's, it was his way of you know, doing something. Helpless. Exactly, right. and for our family, it, 
it was really, I mean, amazing. It, it gave us hope. It was, it was the, you know, great unknown. It was no longer just that he had Alzheimer's disease. He had Alzheimer's disease, but we were involved in something that maybe could, could make a difference and, and maybe was going to improve him in a couple of years. You know, we didn't know. It was just a, a just a really wonderful experience. And um, I, I just can't say enough great things about it really and it, it, they 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 participated in the documentary and i think they just really kind of felt cool yeah no it's interesting because um and we did another documentary on about glenn campbell called glenn campbell i'll be me and he also when he got a diagnosis he wanted to do something he didn't mm -hmm. participate in a clinical trial but he wanted to keep performing even if it was right you know, he People, uh, I think one of the biggest problems and things that lead to stigma is that feeling of helplessness. And I think participating in research for the next generation, for your family, or just even for yourself, because you get better care, makes uh, two things. I think it makes people feel a lot less helpless and right. it gets them better care. I, I shouldn't say that across yes. the board. Then again, I'm not a doctor, but a lot of times they can be much more informed and have more resources um, to, in terms of knowing uh, information and getting information and getting someone to see them if if you're in a, a research very study. very much so I completely agree with that and and I and I think um, mentally for my dad too it was he he felt more positive and and you could mm -hmm. see that I mean it, it really did make a difference in in both of them. There's a um, there's a scene in the documentary film with um, another uh, uh, person uh, who was participating in her second clinical trial and she had first gone through it with her sister and mm -hmm. her sister had Alzheimer's and now she was going through it for herself and the doctor comes in and they hug each other they're like old yes. friends she's like oh you're going through this again you know and so it you could tell that she also feels very positive and and supportive yeah. I mean that uh, that's an excellent point too you're developing negative? relationships with with all of these wonderful people that are great resources and it's just it yeah. really opens a, a whole nother set of um, resources for someone. Were there any negatives? I mean, that were really dramatic for the, you guys or I didn't think with the trial the doctor. Yeah. I, I really think the only negative was when the trial was over and <laughs> it, it, it really, it was, they, it was just their, their, the trial was something we talked about all the time. And so when, when it was over, it was just really kind of, sad for us i think i remember yeah. actually the first time we met you and the trial was over and we were screening the film early on and i don't remember if it was you or your mom pulled me aside and we're like what now we can't get him back into another trial now because you know <laughs> is there anything we could do and i was thinking well maybe there's an exercise trial or um you no know, it's funny that you say that as my mom would my mom asked i don't care if it's the placebo or the drug it makes a difference in him so can can we take it <laughs> It's like, that, no, I don't think that's how it works. <laughs> it's too funny. Um, I have, I, I, I feel like I could keep going with you forever, but I think we probably have to wrap up soon because we're going to show this clip, which by the, and it's funny because what that first clip is about denial. It's a nurse talking. Um, she's a nurse. She takes care of Alzheimer's patients and she didn't see the signs in her mother because she realized she was in denial. So it's really fascinating. Um, so I will, I'm going to say, ask Sarah and uh, Kate to share our one last slide, um, and which is a link to resources. So if, if we've gotten you interested in um, the possibility of participating in a, a, a clinical trial or research study, um, we're going to bring you on, um, oh, there we go. So here's some resources. Um, the first link about Alzheimer's disease is on our Bright Focus's webpage. Um, we have, are the program we do on Alzheimer's is called Alzheimer's Disease Research. So this is gonna bring you to that page and it has a ton of resources. You have to dig around a little bit, but a lot of resources for pretty much anything you could think of to ask. And the second um, link, how to find a clinical trial near you, also on Bright Focus is going to bring you to um, a place where if you're interested, you can actually click through and find out if there is something that you might qualify for. And if it's in the city near you, you can actually look at real trials or studies that are happening. And by the way, a trial, because they would go back and forth, a trial is um, 
usually with a therapeutic, a drug and a placebo, a research study, I hope I'm getting this right, is I think more like, you know, a diet, uh, if you eat only these, you know, green Brussels sprouts, you know, 10 times a week, will it change your cognition or um, exercise or those types of things. Um, so um, then we, uh, here's the link also to the landing page on Bright Focus for information about the documentary. And the final link is a link to the NeuroCare Live, uh, NeuroCare Live webinar series that we were involved with. Um, and let's see, I uh, hope this was informative. That's what I wrote. Um, and we're very happy to receive feedback from you. There, uh, you can email Amanda at the bottom there, A. Russell, if you wanna contact us directly. Um, and we haven't, covered really anything about therapeutics and research and diagnostics. And so if this was useful and meaningful to you, please let us know, maybe we can do some more of them. Um, and um, there's certainly enough topics to keep covering. And I wanna thank you, Anna, so much. You um, do so much for the field by sharing your experience and always always saying yes uh, when we ask you to, to share your experience and really, really appreciate it. Thanks, Nancy, and, I, I, I appreciate it. And I'm very happy to be here. I am a nurse by training and I worked in long-term care for many years and it was right there in front of me and I didn't see it. The symptoms that she showed that I didn't identify as Alzheimer's, she would repeat stories over and over again, but in the exact same words. So she'd tell me a story in five minutes or so and then she would tell me the same story in the same words, as though she hadn't told me the story. That was the symptom that stands out the most to me. It, was, it became clear that she was forgetting things. She didn't live with me, but she lived about a half hour from me. And they, these things were right in front of me and I didn't see it. And I can't call that anything but denial. You can really see, even as a nurse, her, her struggle to recall um, how intense the denial was. And it's very natural to want to avoid or deny uh, a diagnosis of Alzheimer's. It's a terrifying disease. Uh, as we talked about before, there's the, the fear of losing the person you love. Uh, we haven't yet used the word stigma. There is unfortunately still a stigma attached to being diagnosed with Alzheimer's, but there are some real realities that make people so fearful about this disease. If someone still has a business, um, they're afraid that if people know they have a real Alzheimer's uh, diagnosis, that their business will be at risk, their financial planning, their legal planning. So um, it is. it can be terrifying. On the other hand, as uh, Dr. Sabal was saying, it's really critical um, and, and, and helpful to get a diagnosis as early as possible.